right. Uh, Mindy and, and uh, Cameron are going to be passing those out. If you want one, uh, you can you can have it and take it home. I'm not going to start yet because a lot of the material, like you said, is in there. On the front, you're going to see it says The Secret to Saving America. And you're going to see that it says The Secret to Saving America. And I'm going to tell you it's building C4 communities. All right, C4 communities is the secret to saving America. Now, what in the world is that? The, uh, well, let's take a look at some scripture. 1 Thessalonians 12.32 says, Men of Issachar who understand the times and knew what Israel should do, 200 chiefs with all their relatives under their command. Now, you'll, know, you'll notice that this is taken from uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 11 and 12 where King Saul is, you know, commits suicide and Israel is overran and David's mighty men are, they come together to retake Jerusalem. Well, 11 tribes came to fight, one came to lead. And the leaders were the tribe of Ishakar. They were 200 of them with their relatives under their command, and they understood the times and knew what Israel should do. What we're looking for are the 200 who understand the times today and know what America should do. All we know what to do is what we've always done. We're creatures of habit. You know, this passage of Scripture challenges us to know the times and know what we should do. It's not understand the times and be theologically correct and keep doing what we are doing. We've got to do something different if we truly understand what's going on. Uh, I'm of the belief that if we as Christians, and I'm talking about myself included, if we as Christians have been about the business that we, I really believe God wanted us to, we would not be in the position we are now as a culture. <clears throat> it's because we have dropped the ball. It's not because of Congress or the President or anything. It's us. we the ones that put them in place. You remember what the founders told us? We're going to get the government that we deserve. Mm -hmm. Hello. This is where we are. And, and I think we have developed habits that aren't conducive to creating righteousness in the community. You see, we find comfort in our routines. In other words, this is really going to be, this next two month study is going to be about how we can change, not how they can change. <coughs> you know, it's not going to be about anybody outside these four walls. The next two months, as we get together, as we meet, it's all going to be about us. And anybody that comes and sits down in this building. You see, 2 Chronicles 7.14, If my people who are called by my name, my people will, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. <coughs> I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. The healing of the land and forgiveness of, sin, of our sin and the hearing from heaven begins when God's people get right. And so that's what the concentration is going to be on. I like Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercies, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His perfect, pleasing, His good, pleasing and perfect will. In other words, it's our minds that need to be transformed first. That's what we'll be dealing with in the next few months. In the next few months, this is what we're going to be concerned about. Here they are. We're going to be concerned with who we are in Christ and who we are becoming. We're going to be concerned with who we are in Christ and who we are becoming. We're going to be concerned with what our community and country have become and what our community and country can become. Currently, what we as Christians in the churches are doing is not working. It's just not working. Just look at the results. We've got to do something differently. We are calling on all true followers of Christ and congregations to examine who they are and what they're doing. This video is going up on YouTube, so I'm challenging all pastors, all churches, all congregations, all followers of Christ to examine 
who they are and what they're doing. Stop looking at the terrible shape of the community and thinking if somebody else would get right, it would be good. No, we've got to start thinking it's not my brother or my sister, but it's me, me O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. So it's not just those of us in this room that the challenge is going out to. On the web, we're challenging everybody to examine who they are and what they're doing. Here's the vision. I'm just going to throw it right out there to you. This is the overall vision that is not necessarily written in stone, but it's something that we believe that God could be doing. Here's the first one. The first phase is, is a C4 community, a Christ-centered counterculture. The development of a, of a community of people that is Christ-centered, but it is also countercultural. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. Here's the second phase. Seven altars that need to be built in the community that we've identified. We, there could be more, there could be less, but we've seen seven. Scripture and prayer. Marriage and family. Education. Health, uh, service here and beyond. Media. Business. And politics. These are seven altars that we've identified that we need to penetrate and build and impact if we're serious about seeing our community shift and if we're serious about seeing our country coming back to Christ. Now there's several blanks in there. I'll let you catch up. Uh, but we've already begun, in a way, you'll see that we've already begun to create this to a degree. We've also had an event, remember, Constitution Day, where we prayed and we gathered. We had about 100 people get together and pray, read Scripture, and read the Constitution, and read the Declaration of Independence. We haven't done much yet uh, to promote the fair marriage and family, but however... We are, uh, we are joining together with other community leaders to, to, do, to begin an effort for the Coeur d'Alene City Council to repeal their, their ordinance concerning making gay, lesbian people, homosexuals, a special uh, class uh, of discrimination. Uh, you're, you're, you're already seeing on Facebook that could Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, be the first city in America to lock up Christians for their beliefs? That is going to be going up on our sign here in some form. That's already started in Facebook. You might have seen it in the Nicholsworth today. Get ready. You also can see it in the CDA Press in an ad. So we're really challenging the city council on this ordinance. So we are doing something. Education, we've got a homeschool co-op here. We already started some things. Service, we have our service here to different, different uh, organizations has is, is, is already been started. We've already got to a degree, something going on in the media. Did you know, I have yet to have anybody show me where there's any Christian business network in Coeur d'Alene. There's not one. That altar needs to be built. Politics. There's not a Christ first movement for politics in Coeur d'Alene. There are a lot of political groups that Christians are involved in, but we'll learn what I mean about what I say, a Christ-first effort in politics. But we need to build that one. And you notice how they all work together. So phase two is the altars. Phase three, and this is the best I could do, is a freedom center. That's kind of like a building, isn't it? Pentagon. Pentagon. Yeah, okay, the Pentagon. Okay, that's good. We're a C4 community. We're going to be exploding all over the Pentagon. <laughs> Be careful. Be careful. Oh, this is being taped. Okay, all right. Might have to edit that a little bit. Okay, um, but the Freedom Center will go right here. It'll go right somewhere where that, it'll go, that, the, that house and this building will be torn down. And the plans are is to put a 600-seat auditorium right there. And what we're talking about is an educational facility that will be so dynamic that when we send out invitations to churches and school groups and Christian organizations across America to come to the northwest of the Freedom Center, they will come here in droves. This will be a technological wonder. This will be something that almost resembles a ride at Universal. 
And we want it to be an, an experience that when people see the story of the founding of this nation, how God's had His hand on it, that when people see a, another presentation perhaps of the call of Christ or they see, a, they see a presentation on missionary work, whatever it is that they come and they see, they, they want to sign up. They're going to say, man, where can I sign up? Where can I sign up? I want to see America come. I want to see my country come back to Christ. But I'm telling you something. The Freedom Center and the altars will be hollow. Will be hollow if first we're not seeing this community developed. The power behind this strategy, this vision, through the power of the Holy Spirit living through people. That's the power behind this. Without that, this is just a bunch of noise. This is just Hillsdale College West, which we need Hillsdale College West. But it has to, but it has to have, you know, you know, let's say we have, uh, during the summer, we, ha we have a morning matinee and an evening performance of acting, singing, video, just band, orchestra, I mean, just something that's an extravaganza. And you, know, and you have 1,800 people a day going in and out of this Freedom Center during the summer. And let's say that some point during the presentation, not a, a pastor, or, or not a congressman, or, or not somebody that people can't identify with, but somebody just like you, stands up and invites people to come to a conference that will be a week conference, long conference of you leading it, not me. Of you talking to people about how Christ is transforming this community. The power behind this whole vision is us coming together and creating this. Well, just what exactly is it? Let's talk about a Christ-centered counterculture just for a moment. One of the scriptures that, that God showed me in putting this together is Acts 17, 28. Here it is. In Him we live and move and have our being. And, and it, was, it was interesting. God was telling me, I believe, when reading that verse, that where we live and move, we become. It, 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 I feel like that God was telling me that we attend church for an hour a week, but we live and move in an anti-Christian culture, should we be surprised at what Christians are becoming? You notice where it says, you notice it doesn't lead us to believe that where I attend, where I attend for an hour, I become but where I live and move, that's where I become what I am. That's the reason why that I said for the next two months, we're going to examine ourselves. You're going to examine yourselves very closely. What I know what I believe, but what have I become? I know what my mind says I believe is true, but does it reflect it in the way that I live? I, I want to say this because all of us have been living in an American culture that has been like the frog in the kettle. You're, you know what I'm talking about? You throw a frog in boiling water, it jumps out, you put it in the water and it slowly, slowly heated up, it boils to death in the, in the pot. I really believe to some degree all of us have got more of the culture in us than we're willing to admit. And over the next two months, we're going to examine our own selves. Nobody's going to stand over you except the Holy Spirit <laughs> and the Bible. And you're going to be challenged to look deep inside your heart. What's got to change about me and you? And so, uh, basically, a C4 community is a dynamic group of Christians who love Jesus and love America. And we're on a mission to bring people to Christ and to transform, to transform our community. Well, a lot of blanks in there, and there's a reason for that. <coughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I've been trying to narrow things down. You see, I'm just a real simple guy. Really, not really too bright. 
And so things have to be pretty simple for me. And I said, God, narrow it down for me. Help me find my heart. And it just hit me. I love Jesus, and I love America. Amen. Do you know there's probably a little more that motivates me than that? When I see your children, I can, I'm concerned about do they know Jesus and what kind of America are they being raised in? And, and, you know, and I think the mission to see people come to Christ is, is a biblical one. But did you know that it doesn't stop there? That I believe, and we're going to learn it as these weeks go by, that the call to transform our community is just as biblical as the call to lead someone to Christ? Let's move on. The goal is to ultimately reach America. That's the goal. And beyond, actually. We become the change we want people to make. You see, the whole idea is, is that after God does this tremendous job of examining our souls and, and we become everything that He wants us to be, then what happens is we invite people to come into our community and then they're able to see what God's done in us that enables them to change. You see, people live and move inside our C4 community and catch what we have become. God taught me a tremendous lesson that, that, that Christianity is more caught than taught. It's, 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 it's not just being taught something in your mind. Do you know, let me give you a little, I used to train teachers. Uh, and, and I used to teach, I used to train in absence education. And absence education is not like algebra. You're not teaching formulas, and the idea isn't just to complete it and forgive it, and forget it. You, you're, you're, when you're teaching an abstinence education program, you're teaching kids to have a value, and values are not a head issue. Value is a heart issue. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. The mind is the gateway to the soul. What information does is it opens up the mind to the possibilities. That track of going from here to here, from your heart, from your head to your heart. Is a long track to make. But you, you, you're taught it here. You catch it here. Uh, and listen carefully. A brain, a mind, can't teach a heart. Only a heart can teach a heart. And so when people not just hear the difference that could happen through a message, but when they see the difference that is actually taking place in our life, that's when they get it. And what a C4 community is, is a group of Christians who've got it. Hanging around others for the goal for them to get it. Let's just keep going. Let's talk about the DNA. What, what should... What needs to be, what, what, what's the ingredients that need to be inside this, this culture, this, this counterculture, this Christ-centered counterculture to make a difference? Here's the first one. Life change. Now, you've got these scriptures in your material. I suggest you go home and read them. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Jesus Christ has changed my life. Is what that verse is saying. How did it happen? I crawled up on my cross and I died. I died to myself. And it is no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. And this life I live as I walk around this planet, I live by faith in, the, in Jesus. Why? Because He loved me and gave His life for me. A life change is a two-step process. Life change happens when we're born in Christ. Then it happens when we're formed in Christ. Galatians 4, 16 has become one of my favorite Bible verses. You might remember Paul founded the church in Galatia, then he went off for a little while, and when he left, they all, they, the, the, whatever the people believed, left with them. And they became everything they used to be when Paul left. And so Paul wrote them in Galatians, and here's what he said. 
He said, I will enter into the I will enter into the pains of childbirth again until Christ is formed in you. It's not just being born in Christ, it's being formed in Christ. Oh, well, I want to get off preaching there, but we need to move on. Leadership training. The call of Christ is not to believe in me. The call of Christ is to follow me. We teach five levels of leadership here at Reach America, and it's, and it's, it's really where our values lie. I want to cover that in a minute. We also teach here what we call the believer's basics. This has to be a part of this. The believer's basics is the gospel, your personal testimony, that's the PT stands for, and the plan of salvation. The gospel is, is the actual account of Jesus' life. You notice I didn't say it's the story of Jesus. Mother Goose is stories. The Bible is accounts. It's not the story of Noah. It's the historical event of Noah. And you have to train yourself to do that. But it, but, it, but it is the account of Christ. We teach eight points. Then your personal testimony. Here's your, and you'll get this. You'll get this later. Don't write this down now. It's, here's your personal testimony. Here's what every Christian ought to be able to do in 90 seconds. You ready? You ought to be able to tell your life before you met Christ, how you realized you needed Christ, how Christ saved you, and your life since Christ saved you. You ought to be able to have those four points down in less than 90 seconds. You ought to be able to do it in less than a minute. And be able to tell people that. I am discovering, oh, when we get to this point, I am discovering Christians, young and old alike, having trouble remembered when they first believed. And how it happened. And the time that they really... <coughs> Oh, did I ever really like give my not like give my life to Christ? In other words, how can I tell somebody else my life before I met Christ, how I realized I needed Christ, and how I was saved, and my life since Christ, if I can't know the answer to those four questions? This is a powerful tool that has to be into the DNA. And then there's the plan of salvation. Some call it the Romans Road. We call it ABC, uh, admit, believe, confess. You know, we teach people how to, a simple little, little plan of salvation. And, and these, I call it the believer's basics because this is right out of the gate, guys. Right out of the gate. This is what we should be knowing as, as Christians. And I'm, 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 I'm sensing that Christians need definition. We need to start defining our spiritual selves. We need to learn how to start defining spiritual things. And we need to learn how to take these spiritual things and learn how to communicate them to a lost world who needs to hear them. The biblical worldview. This is Jesus. You know, is Jesus real? How is He real? How do we know He's real? The Bible. Is it real? How do we know it's the Word of God? Is it reliable? Creation. God did this in six days. You're nuts. Scientists say, what's the last figure? 15 million years? 16 million years? Or is it billion years? It's billion years. You know, and then Christian Americanism. I'm telling you, my friends, this nation was founded on Christianity. That needs to be in our church. It's taught. And so, then the cultural community transformation element. We ought to be experts on how God changes a community. If somebody were to walk up to you right now and says, how does God change a community? Could you tell them? I want to tell you, for the longest, I couldn't. Yeah, God wants to change this community. Well, Pastor, how does that happen? <laughs> how does it happen? Seven altars. Now, let me just very quickly go over with you the leadership process. Five levels. I told you, we're like skipping a rock on top of the water tonight. Nothing's deep tonight. Everything is just skipping right across the top. 
Okay, look and see. Second, First Peter two twelve. Peter saying, let, "Let when the heathens look at your life, may they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven." In other words, when people look at my life, do they see that Jesus matters to me? When people look at my life, do they see that Jesus matters to me? Has Jesus made a real difference in my life? <laughs> when I was growing up, I, I'll be honest, can I be honest with you? I hated church, honestly. Come on, how many of you hated church growing up? Just, oh, we're the only two honest ones in the room. Oh. <laughs> okay. I hate you had to go to church to hate it. You had to go to church. <laughs> there you go. Well, I hate it. I hate it. I remember we'd have test. I hated testimony tonight. So I was Baptist, you know, you had to have testimony tonight. I think it's usually every fifth every fifth Sunday, which is once a quarter, we'd have testimony night. You need to have the some you had an old deacon up behind the pulpit and he'd go, um nothing. Fifty years ago. Uh, huh? Fifty years ago. Fifty years ago? Yeah. You have an old guy standing up in the pulpit saying, Ah, my life is nothing. And 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 Christ came and I'm saved and I'm still nothing. <laughs> I'm just an old sinner. There is nothing good about me. I'm just a worm. My soul is saved. I'm they're either got sinners that are going to hell or sinners that are going to heaven, and I'm just a sinner. God bless you, praise Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> then the next one would get up and he'd go, you know, I'm just a sinner. And I'm just nothing. You know, Jesus saved me, praise God, but I ain't worth it. <laughs> You know, and there's nothing about me that's good. Don't follow my example. God bless you. Amen. I mean, you know, just one right after the other. I don't know you. I don't know about you, but if I was somebody without Christ sitting in the back, I'd just be dying to come down the aisle to get that, wouldn't you? I mean, come on down. Come accept Jesus. He won't make a doggone dime's worth of difference in your life, but buddy, you're going to go to hell if you don't. <laughs> I want, I want to tell you, until people see that what we got is better than what they got, it ain't happening. They've got to see that Jesus matters. Here's the second. Encourage and serve. Matthew 20, 28. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give His life as a ransom for many. Who can I encourage and serve today? Number three. Third level, a just apprentice. John 5, 19 and 20. God is always at work. Did you know that? And Jesus said the Son is always looking up at the Father because the Father shows Him everything He does and the Son only does what He sees the Father doing. Now, if Jesus couldn't do anything without first checking into heaven, who do we think we are? We're looking for an apprentice. You see, when I sense God at work in someone, am I willing to adjust my life? Here's the deal, guys. I don't want to get too much into the lessons that you're going to study this week, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you this part. I don't know what it is, but something about when I'm saying my prayers in the morning, amen, just, I don't know, it, it, it didn't communicate what I was feeling. Number one, amen said to me the prayer was over. And it almost felt like I was leaving God there. So I started ending my prayer with, let's go. Father, I want you to... I, I've worked up a prayer that I'll show you. I'll pray with... I'll pray this... I'll, I'll show you the prayer I pray every morning now. But at the end of my prayer, I said, God, may you be blessed and glorified for everything I do today. Let's go. Let's get with it. I don't know. Just... You know why? Because God answers prayer as you go. When you pray, when you have a prayer request, guess when God's starting to answer it? That very minute. And He's showing you things throughout the day. If you ain't watching for it, you're going to miss it. Most Christians say they have a hard time learning to discern the voice of God. It's not because God's not talking. It's because we ain't listening. But he's talking. I think sometimes he's screaming. And we're not listening. All right, move on. Develop leaders. Galatians 4.19. I've already shared that with you. In other words, when you get to level four, this is where curriculum comes in. 
This is where formal study comes in. This is where a process comes in to where that you're growing and you're, and you're helping others to grow. And the question is, are those I'm leading growing? Then the, then the last one. You ever thought, what is success of a disciple? Here it is. Are those I'm leading leading others? A level five leader is someone who can point to somebody and say, that person is leading others to lead others. In other words, it's a four-generational process. In 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, it's pretty simple. Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, the things you've heard me say, in other words, me, Paul, is generation number one. The things you've heard me say to you, Timothy, generation number two. The things you've heard me, Saul, say to you, Timothy, I want you to trust two reliable men, third generation, who will be able to lead others, fourth generation. You see what, what look, you know what? It, 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 physically, it takes forever to have a grandchild. It does. But you know, spiritually, it shouldn't. It shouldn't take, take that long at all to have a spiritual grandchild. Or spiritual great-grandchild. If I'm leading others to lead others to lead others within it, I should have me some great grandchildren running around here. You see, that's a level five leader. I, let me, let me. I've got another. A, I got two drawings I want to show you to kind of help illustrate a C4 community. Now you ha, you can't see it, but there's L5s in these dots. These are posts of the fence, and the posts are, are level five leaders. In other words, we need, we need people. I need people to walk up to me and say, Gary, let's work together. I want to be a level five leader. I'm looking for those. I'm looking for those who want to be level fives, because we're going to be the fence posts. And, and I know you've heard the term of, and you can't see it because I had to uh, change... I had to change the background to dark because it wasn't showing on the video. You can't see it. Can you see that line right there? Mm -hmm. All right, that line is, is all around there. In other words, I used to think that uh, a hedge of protection was a, just a spiritual thing. It's not. I really believe that the, that the spiritually mature form a hedge of protection around the, the sheep at the different levels in the middle. I believe God has called the mature leaders, and you're not just mature Christian because you're older. Do you, you understand that? Mm -hmm. You can grow old and never grow up. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> Dick, you're, that's not you. You know, and so, but now you can't see it, and I'm sorry you can't, but now there's a black line going right here. What happens, what, what God was what God was, was teaching me is all, most our ministries in the church are aimed toward those who are, the, who are the closest to hell. Think about it. God said, did you ever stop and think that you should minister to those that are one, that are one step away from heaven? In other words, we try to create God in people's lives when God's saying, if you'll start watching me, I'm already working in a lot of them, and there's a lot of them, the fruit's about ready to pick, and you're not watching. God has instructed me to go to people of passion. Don't try to raise the valley of dry, dead bones. Don't spend all your time trying to win those who are not going to come. Find people with passion that will follow you and want to be a level five leader. What will start happening after a while is you will, you will start to build a momentum that will enable you to build the base to reach those that are hardest to reach. You following me? I know a lot of men that, have, that want to have great ministries, but they keep reaching the most hardest to reach, and they wonder why they're not doing anything. I said, look, have you ever thought about somebody that's easy to reach, that loves what you're doing, that can help you? They go, huh? But they don't need me as much. But you need them. Why did Jesus... Okay, why did Jesus went around healing and raising the dead and never recruited 12 disciples? Would we have a church? No, Jesus would die on the cross and there wouldn't be anybody to start the church. 
Did you know that Jesus spent 75% of his time with the 12 guys he planned on leaving after he left? The richest things you have in the Bible come from their debriefing sessions at night. The all the Gospels were for was training those guys. And for us to see the model as well as what he taught. Guys, I'm standing here to tell you that the re I think one of the reasons why the church is impotent is that we're trying to keep the words of Christ and we kicked his methodology for how it's learned right out the window. Our churches resemble more of the Western education model than they do Jesus' discipleship model. I'm telling you, we need to do a whole lot of examination. And, and because here's the deal. You can't see it, but when relationships start right here to right here to right here, I wish you could see it. It looks like a safety net. It looks like that thing to the firefighters running around with somebody trying to catch them on the second floor. It looks just like that. And, you know, it, we become a safety net for each other. And it becomes a cool place to be. Then there are people outside it that I've got these two L5s going out to reach this one to bring them in. So you got the red one, the red line shows. And they're building mentoring relationships with these two. So the goal eventually is for these two to get on the fence line. Let's see. That's the goal. Here's another way of looking at a C4 community. We in the C4 community go into the anti-Christian culture. Then we bring back with us people. They become like us and sent back out. Then they bring some in. The whole idea of Jesus removing the disciples for three years was to build this community. The disciples had to get it before he sent them into here. I'm going I'm to say something, and it's being taped. We're not going to edit this. I have yet to meet a high school student who's ready for this world. Oh, I've met some, some mature high school kids. I can name them for you if we weren't on video. We have got to understand, folks, that there's a whole lot of getting it to be got before we start trying to get others to get it. And you're, and you're going to start this week learning Jesus' leadership model. All right, there's, there's the Reach America Freedom Center and our counterculture right there. Here's the goal. It's to have people from across America come to the Freedom Center. And then they go home. And these little countercultures start popping up everywhere. This is the goal. They just start popping up everywhere. And when they get populated out there enough, what can happen is a state, is a, first a community can change, then a state can change, then three or four states, and eventually a country can change. It can it really can. The sign of success is when you become a level five leader. You are finding one. A couple of you then find another one. Three of you then begin to find another one. There's a lot of power in threes and fours. Then at some point it just starts to multiply. It just starts to multiply out. And you've got a lot of people that are starting to reflect the values and the lives of the first four. And it just started with you. Now here's the question all of us are going to be faced with for the next two months should you decide to accept this assignment. Your notebooks will destroy in five No. <laughs> All right. Listen. That's the question. That's it. Are you willing to be examined? Are you willing to lay it all out there? Are you little to get a little vulnerable? Are you ready to get a little vulnerable? And let Christ come in some nooks and crannies and dark places. Maybe have a little healing going on. 
maybe to reestablish that relationship with Christ again in your life and it becomes real to you. This is what, the, are you willing to be changed? Are you willing to give up whatever you know life to be to become what Christ wants you to be? This is where it starts, right here. Um, it starts with a Christ-centered counterculture, and it starts with us becoming a part of it. Thank you.